Again, Brenda's done a great job with setting the stage on general taxonomy of methods and solutions in, in machine learning. But obviously the workshop is around deep learning for science. So most of us are gonna really take a deep dive on, on deep learning methods. So most of us is a machine learning engineer in the, uh, in the data and analytics services group at, at NERSC. And as I mentioned earlier, he's really the, uh, the mastermind behind the deep learning uh, summer school. So really any feedback that you have, uh, you know, please do pass it on to him. Uh, Mustafa is a physicist by training, and uh, you know, again, these days he's interested in uh, generative modeling, uh, incorporating physical constraints into deep learning architectures, and really the broad suite of uh, what classes of architectures are most relevant for science problems. All right, go ahead. Well, uh, first, I thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, okay. So, uh, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, so first of all, um, this is one of, so you heard the introduction to machine learning talk this morning. Uh, there are, we have two talks that are specific on neural networks, and there's actually more than that. So today, later, today you will hear Josh Gordon talking about TensorFlow ecosystem, uh, and then after that you'll have a, a hands-on session building the sort of things that we're gonna talk about now uh, with Steve. And uh, tomorrow morning, I'll give another talk on uh, neural networks um, uh, as well. And tomorrow's talk will focus on actual uh, things that you have to do to make these networks work in practice. Um, the second talk to, in uh, tomorrow's morning session, uh, by then you will be deep in the trenches. Uh, so Joel will talk about uh, training very large scale deep learning models on large scale data sets and all, the, all, the, all sorts of practical questions um, and concerns that arise. Um, so it's a steep curve from here until tomorrow morning, uh, uh, essentially the end of the morning session. Um, and then after that, most of the topics will be essentially a, a tour de force of the, all the methods and the uh, applications where people have applied uh, deep learning. So it will border somewhat between applications and also uh, latest research. During my talk, please, um, if you have any question, uh, just raise your hand and ask. I'll try to repeat the question. We won't have an, a chance to pass um, microphone during the talk, but um, please interrupt me and ask any question you have. Okay, so uh, before I get on with my talk, um, you can come here and attend a week of, uh, uh, of, uh, of talks and, uh, and lectures. Um, or you can take an online class on, um, you know, there are, there's no shortage of online classes for teaching uh, deep learning. However, I really think that if you want to understand the, all the intricacies of everything that goes into uh, uh, doing uh, deep learning in practice, uh, you really need a, a solid undergraduate level course uh, in deep learning. Uh, there is one uh, such course online and I think if you have done deep learning, you probably know this course. It's the Stanford um, uh, CS231 uh, course. The videos are from spring 2017. The lectures, uh, the lecture slides have been updated with spring 2018, I think. Um, but the, the videos, the videos are, are great. So if you really want to do deep learning for a living, uh, take some time to actually go through uh, these lectures and probably the homework as well. Um, there are about 14 lectures. Uh, there are less lectures than you will take this during this week. Uh, so it's not really a lot of work. Um, and during making uh, my slides for today and, uh, and tomorrow, I made actually great use of um, uh, these lectures. You'll see a lot of um, uh, snapshots from those. I also make uh, good use of uh, deep learning uh, books. Uh, these are two excellent deep learning books that you probably have seen these before. Um, and um, there, are, but there are many others. Another thing is engaging with, uh, with research. Um, I think there is, you know, if you want to do deep learning um, uh, nowadays, you really have to be um, um, up to date on a lot of the research that is, uh, that is happening, especially if you're using a cutting edge sort of model. I do remember that, um, uh, we gave a talk in uh, in November last year about the scaling, the training, deep learning, scaling uh, uh, at scale, uh, 
Um, and uh, by January, we were about to give another talk and we had to update the slides with the latest research that happened in December. Um, so a lot of stuff are happening, especially if you're working on uh, cutting edge uh, methods. The still.pub is, um, is a, uh, it's a, essentially a journal, a pedagogical uh, journal where they try to, uh, to essentially uh, expose a lot of um, important machine learning and deep learning concepts. Uh, some of them are latest research uh, sort of um, uh, concepts, and some of them are fundamental to everything that we're doing. Like, for example, why does gradient descent with momentum work? Um, so make sure to check out uh, this when you have some time. Okay, so that aside, um, the talk for today, I'll try to, to essentially talk about the neural network, neural networks basics. Uh, okay, trying to find this. Neural networks basics, uh, Brenda did talk about this. I wanna um, uh, go through uh, those basics again. After that, we'll talk about how do we optimize uh, these neural networks and how, um, um, essentially, how do we, uh, how do we uh, construct this problem of optimizing the neural network and then how do we actually find those parameters of the neural network. We'll talk about in practice what we do to monitor the, the training or the learning process of those uh, networks. And then at the end, we'll get into uh, convolutional neural networks uh, basics. Um, I'll try to keep this talk at a conceptual level so you won't see a lot of math. You won't see a lot of uh, practical tips and, and uh, nitty gritty details of actually making these things work. Uh, those will defer them to tomorrow morning. And it's inevitable that there will be one equation or another. So if you look back at the history of, uh, of neural networks, you immediately realize that a lot of the terms that we're using right now did appear before, right? So we talk about uh, perceptrons, they were 1950s. You probably have seen back propagation somewhere. Um, this is 1970s, LSTM, end of the 1990s. So people have been working on this uh, for a while. A lot of the technologies that we use right now, uh, they're not new, right? Uh, however, it's only the, 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 this uh, uh, explosion of results of applying uh, deep learning or, and successes in applying deep learning has only happened uh, recently. Uh, as Brenda mentioned, there are factors for why this has happened. Uh, first of all, we do have data. We have a lot, of, a lot more data than we had before. Uh, something uh, that distinguishes uh, the performance of um, shallow learning sort of methods, the ones that uh, Brenda talked about, like SVM, uh, clustering methods, and, and, and all those sorts of, uh, sort of, sorts of pro um, models uh, from deep learning, is that shallow learning methods, they tend to plateau. Their performance tends to plateau um, after a certain amount of data. Beyond that, Actually, beyond that, it becomes very expensive to, uh, uh, to evaluate them and train them. For example, in clustering, in clustering you might have uh, N-squared sort of algorithms, uh, but they also tend to plateau in performance. Deep learning is very data hungry. You will see tomorrow in uh, Jules' talk that uh, deep learning performance, their model tend to have a, a power law dependence on the amount of data that you train on. And they continue all the way until um, <clears throat> an irreducible error where you can't uh, get more performance than that. So the availability of such data sets to actually build models on uh, is an essential component of why deep learning now uh, has worked. The other thing is uh, being able to, to calculate all of these big matrices very quickly. Uh, and that has happened thanks to all the gamers uh, with <coughs> by GPUs, right? If you look at the at a plot like this, for example, this is uh, the error of the winning uh, ImageNet competition, winning algorithm, um, and, um, and then the number of GPUs is in blue, the error is in, uh, is in red. You see that 2011 was the last time that, that a non-deep learning uh, methods was, was used, and that was, the error was about 26%. Deep learning, the first time that it won this competition, it reduced the error from about, by about 10%, from 26% to 16%. You see that this was a tremendous jump, right? And that was the very first time that GPUs were used for um, uh, such algorithms. Yes. 
um, this is the error rate of the winning algorithm in the competition. <clears throat> so uh, being able to calculate, to build bigger neural networks, uh, bigger functions and optimize them is an essential uh, component in why this works now. And uh, last is that, that uh, a succession of, of algorithms that we have seen on the, on the previous uh, plot um, uh, has finally actually uh, has finally worked. So people were thinking of um, better optimizers, better regularizers, better normalization methods. Um, <clears throat> all of these algorithms, uh, without them, things don't work. And you will see tomorrow, it's not easy actually to get this, these neural networks uh, to work. And um, we will see a lot of algorithms that make it slightly easier uh, to make them converge. Okay, so uh, that said, I wanna get into <coughs> talking more about uh, deep learning. So this is the long story short. This is essentially everything that we'll be talking about today. Uh, so uh, what, what deep learning is, is a family of parametric and nonlinear and hierarchical representation learning functions. So they try to learn representations from the data. And uh, the way that we, we, we optimize them, they're massively optimized with stochastic gradient descent. And their objective is to encode domain knowledge. How do I look at the data and try to learn a certain task from uh, this data set? Uh, and of course, the domain knowledge can be a variety of things, uh, like domain invariances, of stationarity, and a lot of other stuff. We'll try to decode uh, this uh, statement in this talk. So neural networks basics. Um, as Brenda mentioned this morning, what we try to do, we we're, we're trying neural networks and uh, generally we try to build, in neural networks generally, we try to build these models that try to approximate uh, relationships that we have in the data, right? So there's, we, have, we make an assumption that there is some relationship between an input X or an observation X and uh, an output Y. Can be a label, can be an action, uh, can be um, what, what, whatever sort of thing that you want to associate with X. We're making this assumption that this relationship exists. And then we're trying to learn what is that relationship. We're trying to make the, the, uh, uh, the model essentially learn uh, that relationship so that we can take that model and then apply it uh, in real life, right? The simplest way of doing this is to think of, uh, instead of trying to build and to find the, the exact right answers of, of what that um, uh, function can be, we can think of uh, a simple, we can think of it in a simpler way, right? We can break that down that function into atomic uh, functions. We can think of those atomic functions, what they could be, uh, and then try to um, essentially build a hierarchy of these uh, functions. Uh, all the way from the input to y, and we try to optimize um, to, to find the parameters of those atomic functions. The simplest way of doing this is to think of um, affine transformations. So like our, the simplest function you can think of is a linear function, right? You take an input x, you multiply it by a bunch of parameters, and that's it, that's your output. We add a bias here because we need, like what if the input x is not centered around zero or something, right? So you, you need a bias, but this is, so this is linear, with the bias as an affine function. We stack these functions, so the, um, uh, the output of the first hidden layer, or the output of the first operation, we call it the hidden layer one, goes into the next one, the output of the next one goes into the next one, all the way until uh, the output. However, if we do this, if we just stack a bunch of linear functions after each other, the global result, the final result, will be a very big linear function, right? Um, so, and that's not very useful. We are trying to learn very um, complex relationship between X and the output Y. Um, so we do have to have some nonlinearity in there. So what we do is we take the output of the first layer, we pass it through a nonlinearity, and then we call that the, the activation. I'll talk a little bit about, about that, but that will be um, your output of the first layer edge, uh, the first, the hidden layer. And then that one goes into the next one. So essentially, um, we have atomic functions, we pass the outputs of atomic functions into some nonlinearity, and then we build a hierarchy of such operations. And that's what we call a neural network. So in, in this, there are a few terminology here to remember. Um, this is the input layer, 
called an input layer. Um, the hidden layer is uh, a few what we call neurons. We will see this in a little bit. So each one of these takes the, um, in this particular diagram, it takes uh, all the features of the input uh, X and then outputs something. That something goes into all the next uh, neurons of all the other uh, layers. Um, each hidden layer has a bunch of parameters. These are weights and they also have uh, biases. And then there is an output layer. Activations. So the idea of activations is um, essentially that idea of having a nonlinearity in the, uh, in the neural network. Um, and the way that it works is that, as we saw before, uh, we have a number of features. Those number of features, they are weighted. We, we calculate their weighted sum, which is essentially by multiplying them by W. We add a bias. We pass that through an activation function, and we call that the output of the activation function. This is where the um, uh, analogy to uh, real neurons uh, comes in. The idea is you have dendrites. Those dendrites, they collect signal from different places, and then um, the neuron decides whether to fire or not, and then you have uh, the output signals, which goes into other neurons. Bit of terminology here. Uh, the number that we calculate, the weighted sum, is called the pre-activation. Uh, the output of the activation function is called the activation of that uh, neuron. So how do these uh, activations look like? Not the activations, the activation functions. So uh, there is a variety of them. And if you look at papers right now, you'll see that only a few of these uh, appear. Uh, we will talk about them uh, in, um, uh, in details, uh, some of them at least in details. So if you look at most of the recent papers, you will see that uh, ReLU is the most common uh, a rectified linear unit uh, is the most common nonlinearity. Essentially, it takes the input, and if the input is positive, it passes it linearly. If the input is negative, it just chops that out. We will see if this is a good idea or not. I'll talk a little bit about this later. A leaky relu has the same thing, but it, it leaks some part of the negative uh, input. And the exponential linear unit is. Um, is, is similar to the, to the ReLU in, in, in the positive uh, regime. So essentially it's linear in there. And then it has an, an exponential um, in, the, in the negative region. Um, the reason that we use any of them or one of them or the other is uh, mainly because of uh, computational efficiency and also for optimization ease. Is it easier to optimize a neural network with one of these uh, versus the other? Sometimes you want to try in your own network and see if one of them works better for you. Uh, the tan, the tanch or the hyperbolic, the hyperbolic tangent, um, you, you see this mostly in, in recurrent uh, so models uh, nowadays. Uh, I think you will hear more about this later this week. Sigmoids and tanch are also used um, in, uh, as output layers. Uh, you see that immediately here, you see that they have very nice properties, right? Where the sigmoid goes from zero to one, you can, like if you want to represent probability, uh, this would be great, right? You can take any input and squash it into zero to one. Uh, the tan, tan, hyper, tan, the tan hyperbolic goes from minus one to one. This also is a nice property that you might be looking for. Okay, so that's, a, that's what a neural network is. Now, we said that we want to build this neural network to try to approximate some relationship in the data set, right? But what sort of relationships can we approximate? There is a theorem uh, that appeared in early 90s. It's called the Universal Approximation Theorem. Theorem says essentially this, that if you have a neural network with one hidden layer, it can approximate any continuous function that is there, given that you can have as many um, uh, neurons or hidden units in that layer as possible. So essentially, a single hidden layer neural network with a linear output unit can, approx can approximate any continuous uh, function arbitrarily well, given enough hidden units. So the reason that this is an important um, uh, result is that we have a, a theoretical guarantee that if we have the right architecture and if you have the right capacity, uh, we will be able to approximate, at least in principle, we'll be able to approximate the relationship that we have uh, in data. Um, now, of course, this theorem doesn't mention anything about how easy it is to find the parameters of 
um, uh, of such a network, right? Um, so you can, you can have the random parameters, but you don't necessarily have a method finding the right parameters to approximate uh, your function. And it also doesn't mention anything about, it, it also necessitates here um, uh, an arbitrary number of hidden units, um, and that's not practical, right? So you might not have uh, enough um, um, uh, hidden units to actually represent uh, the relationship that you have. Okay, so we talked about neural networks as essentially function approximators. We have a guarantee that um, uh, if we build the right network with the right capacity, uh, we will be able to approximate um, any relationship that we want in the data set. But how do we find the right parameters for uh, of those neural networks? I'm sure you have come across this trick before, you build a cost function, right? So um, the basic idea is that you want, if you have a certain target, I'm, I'm, this is, all of this will be talking in the um, uh, supervised learning, uh, just set up just for illustration, because it's easier to illustrate here, but it's the same thing uh, in unsupervised learning. You will have some target that you want to achieve, right? Uh, so the basic idea is that you have some function, we call it L, we call it the loss, that takes, compares the output of the neural network. So this is F, takes an input X and gives you an output. This is the neural network, compares it to the real, uh, tar the target output that you want your network uh, to give. So that's the loss function. Um, we assume that the loss function, essentially, if it's high, then it's bad. Uh, if, it's, um, if it's small, that means the output of the neural network is very close um, to uh, the real target. And then you average all of that over all of your uh, data set. We call that the cost function. So the cost function is essentially the average over um, uh, many examples of um, the real, uh, the, the, the training data set. Okay, there is a framework called the empirical risk minimization. So if you're looking at any um, uh, uh, sort of um, introductory course in machine learning or in deep learning, you will see this, uh, this framework. Uh, the basic idea is that what we really want to achieve, we don't want to have our network uh, do very, very well on the training data set. What we are really trying to do is to have it do well on a data set that it that hasn't seen before, right? This is what we call the generalization error. We want it to actually generalize beyond the data set that we have. Uh, the two concepts, so if we're only trying to make it work on the training data set, that would be called optimization. If we're trying to make it work on an unseen data set, that would be called learning, right? And that's the, the goal of learning. Um, so the, the real goal is, is to actually have uh, the cost function on the entire data set uh, to be really, really low. Uh, the entire data set, this is the actual, the data, generation the data generation distribution, the original source of your data set. But we don't have access to this one. Uh, this would be called the true risk. That's what we are trying to minimize. But what we end up minimizing, we end up minimizing the empirical risk, which is, uh, the same quantity, but averaged over the training data set that we have. Um, and we call this the empirical risk. The, the reason that I wanted to point this out is uh, because this is generally the, the, at least the theoretical framework from where all of this starts. We're trying to minimize uh, the real risk on uh, the data generation distribution, but we end up um, doing an optimization over uh, the training data set, and then we hope that it will do well on an unseen data set. Okay, this is a great principle, but it doesn't, in, in reality, it's not very, uh, it's good to, um, um, uh, to think about, uh, but it's not how we build these cost functions. Um, for many reasons, uh, it turns out that most of the, of the losses that we're interested in, um, this empirical risk or the risk that, that, that we're interested in, most of the time, it's not smooth. Um, so you can think of the risk, if you're trying to classify uh, cats and dogs, what you're really trying to, to, uh, to say, is this image a cat or a dog? So it's a zero one uh, sort of risk. You either, it's a, either a dog or a cat. There's no, like you don't give me probab, like the real risk is not probabilities. This is 70% cat, this is 30% uh, uh, dog. It's either zero or one, but the zero and one loss 
is not a smooth loss, right? It's not very useful. Um, so what we end up doing in practice, we end up doing having a surrogate loss function and we optimize over uh, that surrogate uh, loss function. Again, we optimize on the training data set and we hope that we are learning. Uh, we hope that we can generalize to an unseen data set. How do we build? Um, uh, and then once you have a surrogate loss function, um, it's very easy to, to build a, a, a cost, right? Um, one, one of the princ great principles is just to use the maximum likelihood. So just essentially the idea of can you, under this loss function, can I maximize the probability of the data set uh, that I have? Um, and then, so you assume that you have a P model uh, that gives you Y uh, given X, and then uh, log of that, that will be the log uh, likelihood, negative that, and then minimize it to maximize uh, this quantity over the training data set. Okay, one example of this is in regression. Um, Brenda talked about regression this morning, and she talked about the, uh, the L2 loss, right? Um, uh, I think I'm sure that you have seen the L2 loss in one uh, form or another, uh, but you probably, I'm not sure if you have all seen uh, where it comes from, at least from a Bayesian uh, optimization perspective. Uh, the idea here is that your P model um, of Y given X um, is distributed normally. That's an assumption. So you say that uh, the difference between Y uh, and the function and the output of your neural network, I want that to be distributed uh, normally, or I assume that the, the real errors in the data sets are distributed normally. And this is an, a good assumption, right? It says that if the, if the output of the neural network is very close to the real output, it's okay. Uh, but if it's very, very far, I want you to penalize um, uh, the neural network strongly, right? So, if I have a P model is a normal, a normal distribution, I can plug that into uh, the log likelihood. And then if you remember the normal distribution is exponential to the power of uh, the mean minus um, uh, the F here, which is the X um, uh, squared. And then when you have the log, it cancels the exponential and you end up with uh, the L2 loss. And this is essentially how you think of, um, uh, this is using the maximum likelihood to build the L2 loss. In a similar fashion, you can also build um, things like the binary, the binary classification loss, for example. Um, it's a, it's a Bernoulli, you assume it's a Bernoulli distribution and you can go through the math and then uh, get your binary loss. Okay, so we built the cost function. How do we find the right parameters? We use, again, the, uh, gradient descent, right? Like this is the oldest trick in the book. Um, you have a function, you're trying to minimize that function. Uh, how do you do that? You take the derivative at the point where you are, and then the derivative points uh, in the direction where the function is increasing, negative that, that will be the descent direction. And then you take one step in the direction of your descent and you update your parameters, right? So mathematically, um, you have you are at WK, and then you take the gradient, you, you make a step with a size alpha uh, in opposite the direction of the gradient, and that takes you to your new parameters, which will be here. And you do that iteratively until you reach a point that you can call um, uh, the, your minima. This is in um, a very, uh, uh, for a very simple function, this is how gradient descent works. Okay, you have, need to remember that we're talking about the learning rate or the step size, where this is where it comes in. We'll talk a little bit about this uh, later. In reality, um, this gradient, gradient descent, when we're talking about just gradient descent, we mean take your entire uh, training data set, evaluate the gradient on the entire training data set, and then make one step. Um, this is, um, it's, it doesn't work really in reality, right? Your data set can be millions of images. It's extremely expensive to actually evaluate your loss function on the entire uh, data set. Another thing is that you don't want your uh, training, the complexity of your, uh, of training or optimizing your network to grow as your uh, data set uh, is growing, right? If I am 
if I'm essentially increasing, uh, the, the, I'm evaluating the entire gradient on the entire data set, that will be O n complexities, linear complexity. But you don't want that. Um, so in practice, we use the gradient, the stochastic gradient descent. We say instead of using the full gradient, let's evaluate um, the, the, uh, the gradient, or approximate that or with just a small number of, uh, of examples from the data set. And we hope that that is, um, you know, is good enough. It will give me a good idea of which direction to go. I don't want to rely too much on, uh, uh, on uh, the gradient. Um, this is what we call stochastic gradient descent. It's stochastic because those examples are uh, presumably random. So you're picking them uh, randomly. You don't want to have a lot of correlations um, in, the, in the randomness of your gradient. So this came in the beginning, it came out as an idea for how to um, uh, do this iterative process of doing gradient descent or optimization much faster. In practice, what we realized is that the noise that you get from the stochastic nature of this uh, gradient uh, estimate, essentially the difference between this gradient um, uh, value from a small, small number of examples and the full uh, data set, it turned out that that noise in itself is extremely important to optimize this neural network. Um, we'll, see an, we'll see a plot later of how the loss function, uh, the surface of this loss function might look like. Um, so essentially that noise, at least intuitively, it helps to kick your network or your parameters out of local minimums so that it goes to a more a global minimum. And in fact, it turns out that the larger the batch that we use, uh, the more problems we have in finding a better, a good minim minimizer of the entire uh, network. So you will see, um, I think during this week, you will see a lot of uh, uh, discussions of large batch uh, training. How do I do? Uh, training with a larger uh, batch. Um, okay, so um, two things to point out here is that uh, the learning rate and the mini batch size, uh, how many examples do you wanna use in every step? Uh, these are hyperparameters. And these are examples of two hyperparameters that are extremely important to find good parameters to train uh, your network. Um, and then um, we'll talk more about this in my talk and then also in other talks. There is a, an, an HPO talk later in the week, hyperparameter optimization uh, talk that discusses just how to do this, this stuff. Uh, generally right now, um, to first order, uh, using a small batch of somewhere between uh, one and 32 and powers of two, um, is reasonable. This is what you will see in most uh, in practice. Uh, once we have, uh, once the community has experience with a certain network, you start seeing larger and larger uh, batch sizes. Uh, for example, ResNet, you will see that most of the time people um, uh, train with 256 batch size. Yes? Yes, so the question is if it makes sense to change the batch size during the, the descent. I, this is an excellent question. Actually, there is a lot of research recently that is doing just that. So essentially it says that when, I'm, when I start from random parameters at the very early stage, I want to have as much noise in my gradient as possible. Um, and then I use a small batch size to make my steps. I'm still exploring, trying to kick myself out of the, all the local minimums. But once I get to a flat uh, region in the lost surface, I can take, I'm more confident, there are less problems, I can take much larger um, uh, steps, and then I can also have, um, uh, I use, essentially larger batch sizes. There, is a lot of, there are a lot of results uh, on this. I think um, uh, as soon as tomorrow, you will be seeing slides showing uh, that sort of uh, thing. Thank you. Any other question? Okay, so how does this uh, look in practice? I just want to emphasize that, um, yeah, when you use uh, learning grades that are off, you will get different loss curves or uh, learning curves. Um, and uh, you will need, really need to find uh, the right um, uh, learning rate. Okay, so how do we find the, the how, how do we actually do this in practice? So if you, if you look, at, if you look uh, uh, at examples trying to visualize, there are a lot of these, we're trying to visualize the lost surface of a real neural network on a real data set. Uh, you'll see examples like this. 
Um, so th I think this is for VGG56, which is one of the winners of the ImageNet uh, competitions, a standard model. People have done a lot of stuff with it. And this is a visualization of the lost surface at a certain point during the training. Um, the way that they do this, they try to find uh, two directions in which the loss changes the most and then try to visualize it because, you know, these networks have tens, if not hundreds of millions of parameters. You want to choose two directions to visualize, to make a surface like this. Um, unfortunately, we can't plot in more than more dimensions. Um, so, and you get something like this. You can immediately see the sort of trouble that you can run into, right? You can get stuck in a lot of local minimus. If you're... <coughs> Um, if your learning rate uh, doesn't, um, uh, doesn't essentially um, uh, kick you out of these local minimas, if you don't have enough noise, um, you will not get to a location like this, right? Um, you can also see that you can get stuck uh, optimizing, like in, in, in certain places you can get stuck in saddle points, right? You can sit just like, you know, in your, in your place. You can also see immediately here that, um, if, if your, for example, your parameters are somewhere on this surface, and then your uh, your loss, your uh, your learning rate is very small, you won't travel far from where you have started, right? But if your learning rate is uh, very large, it can essentially catapult you all the way uh, to a raven somewhere uh, far away. So. Essentially, one can look at this and imagine all sorts of scenarios for where things can go wrong, right? Uh, so how do we do this in practice? How do we actually optimize over uh, surfaces like this? The first, the first place to start is uh, with the optimizers. Um, there is a range of optimizers. People don't use just gradient descent um, uh, in practice. Uh, the first thing that you can think of is that you can have a momentum, so, right? So if you have a ball uh, rolling down a surface, uh, you can, instead of trying to do only locally, uh, trying to make your step based on the local gradient, you can accumulate your speed, right, while you're coming down, and then use that to kind of give you a sense for where you should go the general direction, right? So uh, stochastic gradient set with momentum would be the very first thing to do. Nesterov is a variation over this, which is essentially, do I first, update my uh, location based on my velocity and then evaluate the gradient or, um, or evaluate the gradient and then update. And there is a range of, of other things like Adagrad and RMS prop. Essentially, they try to use um, um, uh, the size of the, of the gradient uh, along the way uh, to, to estimate by the, the size of the step that you're taking. Uh, once you get into Adagrad and RMS prop, we start having different learning rates for different parameters, different updates, uh, scales for different parameters. And then you have Adam. Uh, Adam is, <coughs> is essentially uh, doing somewhat of RMS prop plus um, momentum. Uh, so it combines the two ideas. Uh, and then it also tries to uh, eliminate any bias in the estimates of uh, uh, the, the, the the estimates of the, of the, um, uh, the gradient mean and, uh, uh, and variance. This is very high level. I'm gonna get, probably, if we have time, we can get into the details of these different optimizers uh, tomorrow. Um, you can see in a plot like this that uh, some optimizers, for example, pure SGD gets stuck there. Of course, this is kind of a diagram just to, to show in principle how this happens. If the learning rate is different, it might not get stuck, right? Um, if there is some noise in the gradient, it also might not get stuck. So this is just to illustrate um, uh, the idea, right? And you can see that other sort of optimizers, um, they accumulate momentum, they use um, uh, all sorts of, uh, of things to, to modulate uh, the size of the step size for the different uh, parameters, and then they can actually come downhill very quickly. Yes. Uh, that's true. So uh, in practice, what we have realized is that a lot of these, opt these uh, optimizers, they make it easy to optimize the network if you don't know what parameters uh, to use. So, um, uh, but in practice, the best uh, sort of generalization error uh, comes when you use SGD plus momentum, but it takes a lot of uh, 
uh, hyperparameter optimization to be able to find the right parameters for where GDP is found. Um, so I think uh, this is also something that Brenda mentioned is that when you use something like Adam, uh, you don't worry a lot about the, the exact value of your learning rate or the best value. At least you can start experimenting with the rest of your model um, without having to worry so much about this being completely off. It's less sensitive to the exact value of the learning rate. Uh, but if you look at uh, most of the, the state of the art um, uh, results, uh, like uh, models like ResNet, for example, you'll see that they actually use SGD plus Pompton. They don't use uh, any, other, any of these other optimizers. So Adam is a, is a good place to start with the default parameters of Adam, which is the learning rate one E minus three. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Maybe someone else does. Uh, so, um, yeah. I, I think uh, there are a lot of papers actually in the, in, the, in the world of optimizers, there are a lot of papers that try to, to, uh, to understand why those other optimizers work better um, and why SGD works better. Most of the time it ends up being that you can find I'm not gonna make stuff up, so uh, I think this is something to, to check in the research, the research. Okay, any other question? Okay, so um, I said we have a loss function, we take the gradient of that loss function with a, with a certain parameter, um, and then um, the parameter of the network, and then we take one step in the, in the direction of um, uh, opposite to the gradient, right? Um, but we have a lot of parameters in these networks. How do we get the parameters to, uh, how do we get to the parameters inside the network themselves? Um, not at the very uh, last layer and the output layer, for example. We use, again, the oldest trick uh, in the book, which is the chain rule of calculus uh, to propagate the errors from the loss function all the way to the parameters that we're trying to update. So imagine this is the output Z. Um, and you're trying to get, um, you're trying to update W, you need to actually pass through the entire network, partial Z by partial W would be partial X, partial W, partial Y with partial X, partial Z by partial Y. Um, this is, um, if you're taking a class like CS231, you will see that they spend at least a whole lecture, an hour and 15 minutes, uh, talking only about backpropagation and how you do actually this in practice. There are a lot of things that you want to, um, to take care of. Essentially, how do you do it efficiently uh, on linear on, on modern accelerators? Uh, but for the conceptual understanding of how things work, all you need to remember is that there is a chain rule and uh, your gradients are actually propagating through all the other factors that you have uh, in your network. And this is very important because imagine that one of these is zero. Imagine that like one of these is zero or one of them is extremely small. Um, you will not have any gradient signal going back to earlier layers, right? It would kill the update to, to W immediately. Can also think of like, if this is extremely large, it will also thwart the whole thing off. You will get an add immediately. Um, so this is an important thing to remember when you're doing um, uh, optimization in practice. Okay, so I promise to get into the activations. Uh, we had to go through that idea of the backpropagation because before we get into this. Uh, so RELU, as we mentioned, RELU is, um, uh, is the most common now um, uh, activation function and, and the networks that you see around. Um, and the basic idea, the, the form of the function, if it's linear, if the input is linear, if the input is positive, you go to a linear response. If the input is negative, it's zero. Uh, there are a lot of good properties uh, about this. First of all, it's computationally cheap. It's extremely cheap, right? Um, the other, and th compare this to the sigmoid that has an exponential. We'll talk about this in a bit. Uh, it has exponential are very expensive uh, to calculate. Initially, people thought that sigmoid would be a good way uh, to do it. The other thing is that when it's positive, uh, the slope of this function does not alter the, the slope of the actual output of the neuron it can give very strong uh, gradient signals, right? You see, it's not dying like other functions, right? So the slope here is good to, for uh, gradient propagation. Um, one of the issues with ReLU is that if the output is negative of your neurons, negative, it essentially um, 
um, it kills the it both kills the output, but also kills the gradient, right? We just said that if uh, this this has slope zero, um, so there's nothing will propagate back. So this leads to dead neurons. Um, sometimes this is a good thing. So sometimes we say like, oh, we're looking for sparse representations and sparse response and stuff. Uh, and in that case, this is a good thing. And sometimes it's not. It, uh, if you have too many dead neurons, you're not learning, right? So one way to get around this is to use something called leaky relu, uh, which is essentially keep some, uh, uh, you use some, um, uh, some part of the negative, uh, negative part of, the, uh, of your input. So you have alpha x, uh, alpha times x, x would be negative here, right? And then uh, alpha between zero and one, uh, which is essentially you keep some leakage in your function uh, so that uh, gradients can propagate uh, back. Uh, and this is this is very um, uh, this is very important uh, in in practice. You will see that one of the ways to actually monitor if your network is doing well or not is to look at on how many neurons are not dead. Okay, two other activations I want to talk about. The first one is sigmoid. Uh, so sigmoid we don't use it inside the neural networks uh, in the hidden after hidden layers. So inside the neural networks anymore. Um, you might find it, that said, you might find a lot of things. Um, but in practice, we use it to represent probabilities. Uh, so if the output of my neural network has to be somewhere between zero and one, it's very easy to just take the output of the neural network, which would be on the x-axis, and then uh, that will give me, it will squash that x-axis into uh, zero to one. Uh, and this is great, right, for representing Bernoulli distribution. Um, it's expensive to, to, to compute. However, if you're only using it at the very last layer, it's okay, right? Um, one thing that I want to mention about uh, sigmoid is that, actually, let me say, so a lot of what you will see right now is stuff that you think, oh, this is great, and this is what happens to all of us. Um, you understand the different details, but after you get into deep learning and practice, especially if you're in application, applying deep learning for science, not doing deep learning research, you get into the practice of doing neural networks as plug and play. So you say, oh, this is, I want this output. I'm gonna try uh, with the output, which is between zero and one, and that is a sigmoid function, gives me zero one, that's very nice. And then you're gonna say, oh, I'm gonna try different losses. I'm gonna try maximum likelihood, I'm gonna try uh, L1, I'm gonna try L2. Um, and there are fundamental reasons for why that's a bad idea to use any random loss with any random activation function. One of them is this one. So you can see here that the output of a sigmoid, it has extremely um, vanishing, like this is, this is good, like the gradient here, the slopes here are good, but if you get to very high values, uh, near very high values of x, the gradient vanish immediately, right? Um, and also at very, like immediately, even like as by minus six, you already have almost zero uh, slope. Um, so that's very bad for learning, right? If your network is stuck with very high X uh, values, you're not getting any gradients back. So uh, it's a bad idea to use uh, a sigmoid if your loss function does not have a log uh, to undo this exponentiation. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes, I see your question. So the question is, um, relus they seem to be linear because uh, they always output everything linearly, um, right? Uh, except when it's positive, uh, when it's negative. Uh, and the answer, and how, how come this is a nonlinear function? Uh, the answer is nonlinear because the fact that you're actually killing uh, the, the negative uh, part uh, produces all of these sparse representations. When you compose a lot of them after each other, you're creating, um, you know, nonlinear, big nonlinear functions. Um, and the idea of ReLU, by the way, is it's also connected or inspired uh, by neurons. You have dendrites, and then they either respond or they don't respond. Sometimes the, the whole neuron might respond or not, uh, and then. Uh, uh, if it's just a zero one sort of response, you still create, um, you can yeah, create nonlinear functions. Okay, 
So the point I was trying to make here, if you're using a sigmoid, remember that you have an exponential in there. You remember that you have this uh, vanishing gradient. Uh, and then remember that that needs a log to undo the exponential. Yes. Uh, so what are the properties of uh, probability? So you have the, the sum of our, over all possibilities would be one, right? Uh, the value would be positive. And uh, what else? I think, I think all of them are satisfied. I think the value, that, yes, yeah. So. That's a, that's a great point. So. And that's exactly what what we uh, what we talked about when we said like we have a surrogate loss function. So we're assuming that the um, um, we're assuming a particular distribution, and then we're trying to find the parameters that would actually match that particular distribution. So in this case, like Bernoulli, we are assuming that uh, the data is the, the the actual output is distributed um, uh, according to Bernoulli distribution. We're trying to match that. Um, it's, it's much better for learning. Uh, it's easier to actually optimize networks with these distributions rather than to try to optimize on the original distribution that it's like zero one, for example, that we're looking for. Um, I think it's, it's easier to illustrate this with the softmax because you have a, you have a uh, so the, um, the question, uh, so, okay. So we talked about uh, the, the sigmoid. It's great to, uh, to represent binary uh, sort of probabilities, some number between uh, zero and one. Um, and the question is with it, why is this, um, what if this doesn't actually represent um, uh, the data set, right? In your data, you have, it's either a dog or a cat. It doesn't have probabilities uh, in between. Um, and I'm trying to say that we, this idea is connected to the idea that we're using surrogate loss functions um, because they are easier to actually handle in the optimization process. Um, now, if, what if we have multiple categories, not dogs and cats and dogs, but we have 10, uh, 10 different uh, categories, uh, what do we do? Uh, so we, again, assume that there is some, the data has some distribution. And in this case, we assume that there is a multi um output distribution, and this will be multi-class output. In reality, your real risk, um, things like this, for example, if you're looking at colors, uh, the colors are, color is not the best to explain this, but um, categories of animals, um, your categories are really like, it's either this animal or that animal. It's not probabilities over those. However, using this idea that we have a distribution over all possibilities makes it easier to actually optimize uh, the neural network. So, um, um, when you're looking at an image, trying to identify the animal in that image, uh, you assume that there is a multi distribution and they have different probabilities of being uh, different uh, animals. And that is not really in the distribution of the data, right? In the data, you, they only belong to one class. Um, does that kind of answer your question? We can talk about it later. Okay. So multi distribution, uh, the idea is how do I, if I have a multi-class uh, uh, problem, uh, what sort of loss function do I use? Or what sort of, uh, how do I guarantee um, um, that the output of my network can actually give me uh, something that tells me which, to which class does the object, uh, does the input uh, belong? Uh, and the idea is to use the softmax function. The softmax function says essentially um, exponentiate all of your, the output of all the layers. So all of these layers exponentiate their output and then normalize them um, by the total, right? So the, and that would be the output for every category. And this is essentially gives you uh, the sum of this over all uh, categories would be one because that's the denominator, right? Uh, and then um, uh, the value of each one of these would be the probability that uh, the input belongs to any of the objects that you have. Um, so it does produce a distribution over classes. 
this is different from trying to tell if uh, two different objects are within the uh, within a, a, an image or not. Like for example, if there is a probability that there is a dog and there is a cat, in that case, you want to use a softmax. You use a sigmoid over uh, two different uh, uh, neuron outputs. Okay, so uh, the way that you uh, you use the information that comes out, you say that the class with the largest probability that would be um, uh, the class of the object. So that would be the, the, the guess of the network. Oh. The, if, if the data is noisy, the, your labels themselves would be noisy. So uh, the, the neural network would try to, to do whatever is the target that you have in your own data set. If, uh, and that's a question like that comes back to you, that can you tolerate that noise in your data set or not? And if you can tolerate it, um, how do you want to, to handle it? And if not, you want to remove it from your data set. And this goes back to, yeah, so, um, I think, um, does that answer your question? Okay. Maybe we can get to this in, uh, after the, the talk, okay? So one thing I wanna mention here is that the softmax is also an exponentiation. You want to remember that, so don't use a softmax with an L2 output somehow. Uh, so um, make sure you remember that this needs a log to undo the, uh, the exponentiation. Um, by the way, this uh, classification, using softmask for classification is not only for classification. Uh, a lot of times when we're doing regression, um, reg remember when re we're doing regression, most of the time we end up using an L2. Um, and then a lot of the times we end up, instead of using regression, we classify our output. We know that the output has to have a range between minus 10 and 10. We divide that into different categories and we try to use a softmax to predict um, uh, a distribution over over these different bins rather than try to predict a particular uh, number. Um, and this is for many reasons. One of them is that uh, when you're doing regression and you're trying, your target is just that one number, um, it's a very difficult uh, uh, task for the neural network to learn that. Um, and this is, even though that you are using a, a normal distribution and if the number is very close, uh, still they don't perform very well. Uh, the other thing is that um, the, in, uh, when you're, using, uh, uh, you're doing regression and uh, the output of your neural network is linear, uh, you're really trying to, you're asking the network to output that particular number, uh, but when, you're, when your output is exponentiated like this, all you're asking the neural network is to guess some good number, right? Because, um, because the number really, if it's, uh, if it's maybe three or 10, it will probably give me the same category. It will give me that in the same range. Uh, so uh, the neural network has much bigger range to play with to output that number. Um, you will see that a lot in practice that people, instead of doing the regression, they would divide it into bins and then do classification over the bins. So if, if your data is wrong, if, it's, if the, the, uh, the, your label says it's green and it's not green, uh, then it will just memorize that and your learning will be bad. It's, you're not gonna learn something that generalizes well. If, you have, uh, um, if, you, if the data is just noisy, there's a distribution over, uh, maybe this is like you're showing a certain color that is not a standard color to a uh, 100 people and each one of them gives you some, uh, uh, some sort of guess of what this color is, and that is, is distribu actually represented in the data set, the neural network will try to learn that distribution over your noise. Um, these are two cases, but I'm sure there are so many other cases in between that you'd need to handle them one by one. Okay, so I wanna get into, uh, I think I have 20 minutes, okay. 
I have uh, 20 minutes to go, so I'll get into a few topics um, that are important before we carry on with the rest of the day. Uh, first of all, Brenda talked about how do you monitor your uh, neural networks uh, learning. Um, and uh, I'm sure this idea that you have also seen it before, right? Um, again, what we're trying to do, we're not trying to optimize, we're trying to learn. So we're trying to generalize beyond the data set that we have. Uh, so if you look at the error uh, of your, fun your, your neural network uh, output or the loss function or any surrogate uh, for this quantity, um, and then you evaluate that on your training data set, it should be going down all the time. So optimization is happening, right? However, we're trying to generalize to some other data set. So we usually split the, the, the original data into three categories, a training data, a validation data, and a test data set. The test data set, you just hide until the very last day before you submit your papers. So the very last night, don't even bother trying to do anything on the test data set. Um, this is extremely precious. You really don't want to do it. You don't want to look at it at all until the very last minute. Um, the validation data set, I prefer a different uh, name for it. It's called the development data set. Um, sometimes you even split the validation into two data sets. One of them is called development. The other one is validation. The development data set is something that you use to tune your hyperparameters. Um, the, uh, the, the validation data set is to monitor the learning process. Um, tuning the hyperparameters, you don't want to overtune them to actually, you know, you're overfitting to the actual validation data set that you have. That's why sometimes you, you keep a development data set aside. Uh, the breakdown of this, the general consensus is 80-10-10. Uh, you will see a lot of 60-20-20. Uh, or any other variation. Uh, I prefer to have as large of validation and test data sets as possible uh, because you really don't want to fool yourself, right? Like you don't want to come out, oh, it's, it's great and stuff. Uh, you're, if you're really trying to do science, you want to have um, um, confidence that you're really doing the right thing uh, or your network is doing the right thing. Um, now, how do these, uh, these curves look like? Uh, there are multiple regimes. Um, if you're comparing to the training data set, you, there's the and the validation, there's the regime where uh, you're essentially your model is underfitting. Uh, underfitting means that you're not even doing well on the training data set itself. Uh, and that has, there are many things that you would need to check. We'll get into some of these tomorrow, uh, but uh, the very first thing you want, you want to see if you have a bug in your, net, in your code before any of these, if you're underfitting. Um, after that, you want to probably check your model architecture and stuff. Um, actually, before that, you, you want to check your learning rate before um, the model architecture. Because if your learning rate, imagine, if it's extremely small, um, that means you're not really getting, you're not taking large steps, you know, that are large enough to get to a minima. And it's going to take forever uh, to, to get to, to a meaningful minima. So you want to check the learning rate. After that, you probably want to look at the model architecture. If this check out, you probably want to either train longer or look at either other hyperparameters. Um, these are of no particular order at the moment, but checking the learning rate would be the very first thing. Um, I want to emphasize that the validation uh, error and the training error being close to each other all the time means that you are underfitting. So even if you're, you have trained for three days and they are still extremely close to each other, you're still underfitting. Very likely you're still underfitting. You need to, to check what's going on, especially check the learning rate. Um, the idea is that if I am not underfitting, if I'm not underfitting, the training loss should be, I should be do much better on my training data set than on my uh, validation data set. Because these neural networks, they are over uh, parameterized, they're extremely powerful, they can actually overfit any data set. We will see how to make use of this later. The other regime is the overfitting regime. This is the regime where we're trying, to, we're trying to get to this one so that we know where it is, so that we can stop the optimization just before we get there, right? Um, so the overfitting regime, I do very well on my training data set and uh, not that well on the validation. It kind of comes down and then starts climbing. As soon as it starts climbing, I know that I started overfitting. This is what we call the generalization gap, and this is what uh, you spend most of your time trying to close this generalization gap. We're trying to move essentially this point uh, to much further along. Um, what do you do when you are overfitting? There is a lot of things that you can do. We will talk about these 
um, uh, tomorrow. Um, uh, some of them is essentially the learning rate. So there could be problems with the learning rate. Um, the data set could be not enough, right? If you don't have enough data set, you probably want to increase that. Uh, there are uh, ways if you can't go and collect more data, there are ways to augment the data set that you have, you can do that. And then once all of these things check out, you're welcome to deep learning, you start doing regularization. Uh, so regularization techniques are the stuff that we'll talk about tomorrow. Essentially, how do I uh, make, improve the, generalize, the generalizability or uh, the ability of my model to generalize uh, to un unseen data set. Uh, we'll talk about this uh, tomorrow. And then if all of this check out, you probably, and you're, if you're still overfitting and you're not satisfied with your validation error, you probably want to reduce the model complexity. Yeah, so, yeah. So you, you want to, one, one way is to check the number of uh, the, uh, hidden, yeah, if you're, it depends on the problem really. Uh, it could be that, um, um, your model is not learning really as fast enough. So you probably have uh, uh, connections that have problems on them. You have bottleneck layers that are too narrow uh, for your model to learn. Um, but in the general sense, yes, you want to check the number of layers that you have, the sizes of each of the layers and all of that. If you're not overfitting to the training data set, there is something terribly wrong. We'll talk about this. Underfitting, you should get out of that regime very quickly. So that's, that's, your first, that's your first couple of hours with working with the model. You should get out of that regime. Uh, and then you spend most of your time doing, essentially trying to push this point uh, to further uh, on. Um, this point, this is what we call the early stopping point, which is essentially you want to stop the training uh, as soon as your validation error uh, starts climbing. And it's a, a sort of a regularization technique. We'll talk a little bit about this tomorrow. Okay. so. Um, I have 15 more minutes, and um, I want to get into the last topic for today, which is convolutional neural networks. Um, so you can build all of all sorts of functions. So we, we saw a setup uh, where we have these fully connected dense layer functions. Uh, they take uh, the entire input and then try to give an output. We have a lot of them stacked after each other. We talked about um, the uh, uh, universal approximation theorem. We said that this particular function can approximate, if given enough capacity, it can approximate any continuous function that there is. Uh, however, um, this fun th that particular setup with the dense layers uh, doesn't assume anything about our data set, right? Uh, but our data set, we know that there are certain things in that data set that we know that they're absolutely true. Uh, for example, if I have, um, uh, if I have objects in my data set, I know if those objects are in the upper left, try, uh, upper left or upper right or anywhere they appear in the data set, uh, they should be the same, uh, same cat, for example, right? It's not gonna change. So we know that the stuff that I'm looking for in my image are translation invariant. It's like they're translation invariant. So essentially wherever they appear, they're gonna stay the same uh, object. Um, this sort of information or knowledge about the data set, this is what we call a prior knowledge. And then a lot of the work that goes into building neural networks into how do I incorporate those prior knowledge or these uh, constraints or knowledge about the data set in the actual architecture. That saves me a lot of things. First of all, I'm not trying to solve an extremely general problem. I'm not trying to, you know, um, you know, kill a fly with a, with a, cam, a cannon or something, right? Like I'm, I'm actually using the right tool for the right job. Um, and this is not only for, we'll talk about how is, this is achieved in, in CNNs, but this is um, in, in science is actually more, uh, it's, we see that more often than in, in other, um, uh, other areas. You can imagine, for example, if you come from a, a physical sciences background or in physics, we always talk about rotation groups, right? We know that all of our objects are rotationally invariant, the molecule, however it looks like, or the protein structure, however it looks like it should stay, it's the same uh, object or the same uh, protein, right? So how do you uh, build a neural network that respects all of that, uh, those invariances? Um, when we incorporate those invariances as uh, infinite priors in the architecture that we have, we tend to learn first, essentially models that generalize much better. Uh, they're not gonna respect that on your training data set and then uh, disrespect it or violate it on the validation data set. We know that at least those invariances or those priors are not violated. Um, and also 
the models tend to be more uh, data efficient, uh, efficient, so I can use much less data to train the same um, network. Okay, so all of that intro set. We'll see how CNNs uh, achieve essentially that. Uh, so this is fully connected networks that we talked about earlier today. Um, you have your input is in blue and uh, every neuron is connected to every single one of these uh, inputs and that's why we call it a, a fully connected uh, network. Um, um, one thing that we, uh, 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 we can do is uh, look at, we do sparse connectivity, right? If I'm looking only, if I'm thinking that only the local uh, sort of information is important and I don't have to correlate um, uh, pixels or inputs or features that are far away from each other, um, I can just you know, have a local connectivity. I can have more neurons. Each one of those neurons is only locally connected uh, to a few um, uh, input features. I can do something uh, further than that. If I know that the stuff that I'm looking for are the same wherever they are, it doesn't really matter where they are in the, in the input, uh, I can share or I can reuse the same parameters uh, for all the detectors, right? Instead of having different parameters here, I can have the same uh, parameters uh, everywhere. And this is what we call parameter sharing. So what does this bias? Um, essentially bias the, the idea of uh, translation invariance, right? Uh, now I have, a, instead of having something that takes the entire input and tries to output the gigantic output, I have a much smaller uh, kernel or a small parameters or a small detector that is sliding over the input and trying to produce and to tell me in this batch uh, what response should I have to this batch and this batch and this batch. And I do a lot of parameter saving, right? I have much and uh, less parameters. And this is the idea of convolutions. This is how convolutions work. Uh, essentially, you have a bunch of parameters, um, you slide over your input, and then you do a dot product uh, with, of your weights with your input, you add a bias, uh, and then you move on to the next, to you slide the kernel over, and you move on to the next thing. Again, what does this uh, achieve? We have sparse connectivity, uh, it's only local responses, we have parameter sharing, we have way less number of parameters, we'll see an example in a bit, and we also have translation equivariance. Um, you can check what the difference equivariance and invariance is later, but generally the basic idea is if I have an object in my, in my input, it doesn't matter where that object is. I don't need to learn different parameters in different places. Uh, this is, again, this is an infinite prior on uh, what sort of data that I'm looking at. I'm saying that my data has that property of being, having objects being um, translationally invariant. A uh, few terminologies. Um, that this is my input matrix. We call it an input matrix. Uh, this is a convolution kernel or filter. Um, so you will see that people, would, if they say a kernel, that means it's just a bunch of weights that you multiply by the input. They can, it's also called a filter. Um, so you'll see that everywhere. And then the output is most of the time people say um, a feature map. Uh, sometimes people say it's an activation map. Uh, an example of how this works, uh, in reality, you have an image. Uh, the image is 32 by 32 by three. The three is the number of channels, uh, red, green, blue. Um, and then you have a filter. Uh, the filter tries, for example, a filter five by five by three, um, and this slides over the input. Um, the, your filter has to have the same number of, um, uh, like uh, three to match the, the, the channels, right? So essentially you will have um, three sets of five by five parameters to process your input. And then uh, if you do the math, you'll, you will see that your output is 28 by 28 uh, activation map, and it has one channel here. Um, you can immediately see with these numbers that if I have just to ingest this uh, input, if I was using a fully connected network, that will have at least 32 by 32 by three. That's like 3,000 or something. Um, and this, uh, and then multiply by the number of outputs that I want to have. But at least for one neuron, that will be about 3,000 parameters. Uh, and when I'm using a convolutional kernel, this is five by five by three, this is 75 parameters. There is almost two orders of magnitude reduction um, in the number of parameters immediately from here. You can stack more of these filters to have multiple outputs. Um, so essentially, if you, have one, you want to six activation maps as an output, you will have 
uh, six times five times five um, uh, convolutional kernels, and each one of them will have three uh, channels if the input has three channels. So that's these are the general like basic um, things about convolutions that you need to know. If you look at convolutional um, uh, neural networks, you will see that there is another type of layers um, that we use. Um, the essential idea is that I have a lot of these activations are coming out as I am coming. I'm coming down the the, the pipeline of of, uh, of convolutions. Um, sometimes we want to uh, to to reduce the size of uh, these feature maps that uh, are coming out. And essentially we wanted to, okay, you, have, you are outputting uh, 28 by 28, but I want you to summarize that into 14 by 14. Um, so, and to do this, we, we use what, is, what we call pooling layers. So essentially the pooling layers, they replace, this is an example of a pooling layer with a kernel size two. So essentially you look at the, this is, um, I'm looking at two by two, uh, matrix, and I'm, then I'm deciding how to summarize this two by two matrix. Uh, two, another two by two matrix, I'm trying to summarize that. Uh, I can do average pooling, where I would average all of these numbers into one number. I can also do um, max pooling, where I just output uh, the maximum number in this two by two matrix. Uh, what does this, uh, why is this uh, uh, useful? Uh, first of all, it reduces the, uh, the size of these activations, right? And this is very, um, very, very useful for all sorts of computational um, uh, and optimization uh, needs, right? I, you can think like it would be probably easier to optimize the network if I start getting uh, less and less um, uh, summary sort of features. The other thing is that it has some sort of local invariance to small variations. If my maximum is, if my maximum, Okay, if my maximum is here or here or here, it doesn't really matter. I just want you to, uh, to get it right approximately. So having your, your entire network not being extremely sensitive to local variations is another sort of an infinite prior. They were just saying that, you know, my data is, it doesn't really depend on the exact location of that pixel. It depends on the global, you have to pay attention to the global uh, picture. And this is, this is what pooling achieves. Another way of reducing the size of the activation maps is to use strided convolutions. Strided convolutions, I just wanted to mention this quickly I added just before the talk, that's why there's no text. But anyway, so the, the basic idea is to do uh, convolutions, and this is not moving. Okay, it moves somewhere else. Uh, okay, so the basic idea is to, uh, you have your kernel, and instead of stepping um, one pixel at a time, uh, when you're activating, you're stepping, for example, two with stride two, two pixels at a time. And in that way, you can reduce uh, your input uh, into some um, uh, feature map with a smaller size. Uh, the trend, um, people usually use max pooling or average pooling, but uh, both of them make an assumption about how do I want to summarize my feature maps into something smaller. Um, why people started using strider convolutions, uh, the basic idea was, oh, let the network learn whatever uh, it wants, um, how to summarize the information. Uh, so you will see that uh, there is a strain of neural networks called the all convolutional neural networks where there is no pooling layers whatsoever. Uh, and then all of the, that summarization and, uh, um, uh, happens using strided convolutions. Uh, then you can uh, put all of that together and build an extremely large uh, neural network. This is uh, a neural network. Uh, convolution neural network is an input. Um, okay. I think this doesn't work anymore. So uh, this is an input. It's 24 by 24 by three. Uh, there's a, two convolution layers and then max pooling. Uh, this gets us to another um, set of uh, feature maps. You see the trend is that usually they, they have less spatial dimensions and then more uh, depth uh, for these output or more number of parameters. Um, the way, at least intuitively, the way that you think about this is that the, the, the depth or the number of parameters are uh, the number of, um, uh, of feature sort of coordinates for, so red, green, blue would be, that's three parameter uh, input. And then uh, the output of the first layer, I want you to summarize your input into something um, uh, along the, the depth dimension, which is the number of filters. This is sort of vague. We can talk about this, um, a, little bit this uh, a bit of this later. 
one thing I wanted to mention before we finish is that what do these networks learn? Um, there are all sorts of ways to try to visualize and understand what these networks are learning. Uh, this is an example of a very, this is actually, this is AlexNet. This is the very first uh, neural network that has won the ImageNet uh, competition. Uh, if you go and you try to visualize uh, what would be the uh, input that would maximize the activation of different, um, uh, different neuron um, at different layers, you would see that uh, they have actually distinct, uh, distinct features. You will see that very early on, uh, they, would, they tend to have edges uh, and hues here if you're looking at different colors. Uh, and then by the second or third layer, you start seeing that they activate on texture. Uh, and then by another layer, they start becoming, like they have more uh, features that are, represent things that we might know in reality, like cars and, and dogs and stuff, you can see them here. Um, and then, and then you know, we have a, a final layer here that takes all of those uh, features and tries to classify them into uh, 1,000 objects of ImageNet. And you start seeing here the stuff that they can recognize. You can think, there are many ways to think of this, but you can think of them as essentially templates, right? So I'm, I'm doing template matching over my input. Um, but there is one property that is universal to most of the networks, at least as far as I know, all the networks that we have seen is that the very early layers, they tend to learn um, simple features, simple motifs like edges and blobs and stuff, they start learning texture and then they start composing more and more abstract sort of um, uh, filters or templates um, uh, by, as the depth uh, goes on by the end of the layer. Um, and this is, this is actually a very important result. We'll talk about how this is important for transfer learning uh, tomorrow. Um, but it also, it's, it's important from uh, uh, the prior knowledge idea that we were talking about earlier. We said that uh, we try to incorporate as much prior knowledge in my, our networks as possible. One prior knowledge is that the world that we live in is compositional, right? Uh, things, bigger things are composed of simpler things. You don't have to understand how a dog is made, you just have to understand like the, all the little edges that when you combine them together, they make a picture uh, of a dog. This idea of that the world we live in is compositional is extremely important. Um, we might talk about it tomorrow. Um, yes, that's true. So uh, I think you touched on so many points. It is true that most of the time uh, neural CNNs tend to work much better than any other architecture. And uh, it could very well be because we know how to optimize CNNs. We don't know how to optimize any other architecture. Humans have evolved to optimize CNNs over the past five years. Um, the other thing is that the other point that which uh, um, uh, you, you mentioned, which is if we are able to design different types of architectures, we can do a search over the, the atomic components that we have. So we know CNNs, we know skip, we have skip connections, we have uh, fully connected layers. We, we can do a neural architecture search over these, and this is like what AutoML field does. Uh, but if we can really find a way to, the, to incorporate um, an automa automatic way to incorporate our prior knowledge about the data into the architecture, I'm not aware of uh, any uh, work like this. Um, okay, so um, visualization, understanding what these neural networks work. There are three excellent articles by Chris Ola on uh, distill.pub. They're amazing. They have a lot of uh, interactive sort of uh, diagrams and features and stuff that they're really amusing to, to look at. Um, so finally, I just wanted to, uh, again, I hope that this has been uh, illustrated, this sentence. Um, the, what we are looking at are as a family of parametric nonlinear and hierarchical representation learning functions. They try to learn representations from the data. We optimize them using uh, stochastic gradient descent. We, you will be um, taking hands-on classes uh, today, or at least one class, and Josh will talk about uh, TensorFlow ecosystem as a framework. I want to give you two practical tips before tomorrow. We're gonna talk about more things tomorrow. Uh, first thing is that how do you, debugging neural network is very, very tricky, and it takes a long time and a lot of, um, uh, a lot of experience, uh, to the point that uh, there's one person who's very famous in the deep learning community 
um, when he got his last um, uh, promotion at, uh, at Google, his report for two years of work um, was, uh, I, I don't only propose neural networks, I know how to make them work. And this is, I know that it's, it sounds funny, but it's, and that was the entire report and he got his promotion. Uh, this idea of being able to actually optimize neural network and make them work is not, a, is not a simple business. And we'll talk about a lot of this uh, tomorrow. You will attend a lot of these talks. Uh, you will see a lot of reports and blog posts online, uh, but that is not uh, going to, give, to actually uh, replace actual hands-on uh, experience. So uh, two tips. The first one is that um, try to at least, I know that it looks like neural networks are black boxes, uh, but there are things that I know that they should uh, be able to do uh, or things that are predictable. First thing is uh, the value of the loss at the very, very first step. Uh, so if I'm classifying over 10 different objects, I know that the output should be random, uniformly distributed over the 10 uh, different objects. If it's not, then there is a problem, right? So the minus log one over 10, which is a random probability, should give you 2.3. Um, you can go and actually do that. This is in Keras. You will see how to do that later today. Uh, this is, um, I don't have uh, my pointer anymore, but this is essentially I'm doing a fit over a single batch of data, 0 to 32, and then the batch size is 32. Um, so try to fit a single batch of data and then uh, see what the, your output is. You should be able to expect this number. If this is, you would be surprised how often this number is off and because there is something wrong. The other uh, tip is that you need to be able, again, we said these are extremely large neural networks. They're over-parameterized. They're very powerful. They can learn anything in the data. There are actual results, paper results showing that they can memorize entire noise data. Just generate random sample of complete noise data with millions of images. They will be able to memorize them with 100% recall accuracy. They should be able to memorize a small part of your data set. If they can't, then there is a problem. You don't need to try to do anything else. So the very first thing you need to do is train on a single batch. Just take one batch, train for whatever number of epochs. Here I'm training for 1,000 epochs. And then see, observe that your loss function is uh, dropping. Uh, and it's actually dropping very fast. And you get 100% accuracy extremely quickly. If you can't get that past this point, don't even try to do anything else. There is something wrong. Either your initialization is wrong, um, your learning rate is wrong, you're not really training, whatever it is. Um, so, and you, again, you'd be surprised how often uh, this, you know, saves you hours and hours of work. Uh, with that said, there's more of these steps in the upcoming uh, lectures, and uh, I think we took uh, any, a lot of questions. Do you have any other questions? The thing is, in principle, no. So in principle, if we have the perfect optimizer, op optimization algorithm, we will be able, the fully connected network will be able to learn the same uh, sort of um, uh, function that you learn with a convolution neural network. But uh, even if you have that perfect optimizer, why would you want to do that? If you know that that sort of prior about your data is there and it's true, why do you want to waste computational resources? The second thing is that um, uh, data efficiency, uh, it's much easier to optimize um, when you have these priors incorporated in the architecture than uh, not. The third thing is, which is the very first one, we don't have such an optimizer. We don't know, if we use gradient descent um, and you're unlikely to be able to find the function that you get with a convolution neural network from a fully connected network. Um, so the question is, uh, for how about rotational invariance? We talked about the translation invariance. That's a great question. And I think a lot of people have, uh, have wor are working on this. Uh, you probably, I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, capsule net. Uh, that was one attempt to try to do this, uh, which is essentially to have a, a capsule that uh, at least locally respects uh, rotation invariance. Um, my understanding right now is that it uh, turned out that it's not very easy to optimize. It's not as easy to optimize as the ones that we have uh, right now. Um, a simple way of trying to get rotation invariance, which is not really rotation, local rotation invariance, is to do data augmentation and force, essentially rotate your entire data sets on the fly. It doesn't matter if the cat is upright or, or, or tilted or whatever, rotate it on the fly and enforce that by changing your data set itself. Um, 
so that's how we do it in practice. Uh, there is, yeah, there is also a slew of other architectures that try to get translation invariance in, uh, or at rotation invariance. In uh, physical sciences, uh, we have um, uh, Tess Smet um, and a few other people uh, here at the lab are working on essentially how to incorporate certain group symmetries, not only like simple uh, SO3 would be one of them, which is just the rotations uh, along, but how do you do like other stuff like rotation and translation and stuff. There are people working on this. Most of the time it ends up being that it's not as easy. We, again, we know how to optimize CNNs. We might not know uh, at least immediately how to optimize these new sort of architectures. Any other questions?